take a trip today to Jericho and look at the archaeology that connects to the biblical story. Uh, last time I was here, I believe it was, preaching, uh, I talked about the biblical account of the fall of Jericho. And we're going to look at how that connects to what the archaeologists find there in Jericho. Before we do, I'd like to offer another prayer. Lord, guide us to understand more about your great wisdom and the reliability of your word as we share together this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the Jordan River. It is not a huge river. Uh, it's not real wide. It usually stays between its banks, at least most of the time. Uh, and the Bible talks about Israel crossing the Jordan at harvest time. When the river overflows all its banks, the Bible says. But the Jordan River had fords. You know what a ford is? Shallow place in the river where you can cross. They didn't have bridges in those days. So you found places where the rocks were such that the river spread out wide and, and shallow. And you can just walk across most of the time. Well, in flood season, that doesn't work. Comes up out of the riverbed, overflows the, the banks into the lowlands beside. And there's no crossing the river by any simple means during flood season. The story of Gideon, as the Israelites are chasing the Midianites who are fleeing, they say, take the fords so they can't escape. There's the fords being used actively all the time. There were places you could walk across the Jordan River if you chose a different time of year to do it. So why would God choose to do it the hard way? The most difficult time. Well, uh, I, I have suspicions on some of it, but here's what the Bible says. Joshua 3.15. As those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped into the edge of the waters, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, the river stopped flowing as soon as their feet touched the water, and the Bible says it piled up in a great heap, and it names the spot upstream, where it just stacked up, waiting for a chance to go again. I think partly God was impressing the local nations about his power. He's about to bring Israel into their territory and ask them to leave. <laughs> He'd like it to go as smoothly as it can, uh, and their deep respect for his power is going to help that process. So God decides to put on a display of his power. He doesn't walk the Israelites across the fords. He waits for the flood season and stops the river and stacks it up. That intimidated the people. When, Rachel said, sorry, when Rahab said to the spies, we're all scared to death of you guys. That was before the Jordan stopped. That was based on... We heard what happened when you came out of Egypt. We heard what happened at the Red Sea. Now they see it happen with the Jordan River. And the lesson is pretty clear to them. Think twice about messing with Israel's God. Think twice about that. He's, he's a powerful God. He does things I don't think my God does. Think about it before you get yourself in trouble. This is the ruins of ancient Jericho, the tell. And when I visited in Israel, one of the first things you learn is to recognize a tell, the remains of an old city. Usually you see them first on the skyline or in the distance, and they have a fairly steep slope to the sides and relatively flat tops sticking up above whatever terrain is around. And you look over there and you say, oh, flat-topped hill. I'll bet that's a tell. And you're usually right. This is usually the remains of an ancient city. Now, this one has been carved up by the archaeologists, so it might not have the classic shape so much anymore. Uh, this is Tel Es Sultan, 
ancient Jericho. We're looking from the air toward the south along the length of the tell. Jericho is the lowest city in the world and also claims to be the oldest city in the world. Uh, I think they can win hands down on the lowest city because the uh, Dead Sea in there, not far from there, is the lowest spot uh, on, on the surface of the earth. So they got that one hands down. I don't know about the oldest city, uh, but they, they certainly make that claim. This is an ancient fortification tower deep down in the layers of the Tell. When the city was quite young and the Tell was very small, but as time goes on, uh, your city gets destroyed and the tell keeps getting higher. It's usually easier to kind of bulldoze, we would say. They didn't have bulldozers, but kind of knock down the junk, fill in the bad stuff, and, and continue building up, besides which it makes your tell taller, and then it's easier to defend the next time. And, and so the, the, the rising hill got quite high on, on some of them before they were done. This is very, very old and down near the bottom when they dug down in excavating. The Bible describes the seven-day siege uh, by Israel under Joshua, marched around once each day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day, saying nothing until the trumpet blew. They all shouted a great shout, and when they did, the walls fell down. The, the Hebrew there about the walls fell down, a... a a translation that gives the flavor more correctly would say the walls fell beneath themselves. Now, if you look at the picture here, you see that there is a stone retaining wall at the bottom part of the wall. The upper part of the wall is the wall itself. The retaining wall holds the hill. And then the wall sits on top of the retaining wall. And what happened was the wall on top of the retaining wall fell out in front of the retaining wall. The retaining wall itself didn't fall down. And if the walls had fallen in, the Israelites would still have had a challenge getting into Jericho. But because the walls fell out, uh, they had an easy time. They just clambered over the rubble of the wall and made a kind of natural ramp for them to just go right up into the city of Jericho. The Bible says they didn't take anything from the city of Jericho except the metals, which were dedicated to the sanctuary, with the asterisk for Achan, who took a gold wedge and a Babylonish garment. They were just too good for him to pass by, and uh, they lost the battle at uh, Ai and, and the whole story there. Uh, God had told them, take nothing. Now, again, that doesn't make much sense. Why do you leave it? There's some good stuff in there, as, as Achan realized. There's some valuable stuff in there. God says, don't take anything except the metals, and then they were to burn the city, which they did. God's doing something there that I didn't catch for a long time, and we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. Then because God had put a curse on it and on anyone who tried to rebuild the city, it remained basically uninhabited for 500 years. What do the archaeologists say about Jericho? It's kind of interesting. Kathleen Kenyon, famous archaeologist in the 1950s, went to Jericho. And after her excavations there, she said, at the time of Joshua, the city had been uninhabited since 1550 BC, which is about 300 years. The story of the walls falling must be a myth since there was no walled city in Joshua's day. Now, if she's correct that there was no wall in Joshua's day, then she is also correct in saying the wall didn't fall down. But the Bible says there was a wall, and the wall fell down. So how come her story doesn't match with the Bible's story? Let's go digging in Jericho a little bit and see what we find out. But first, before we go to the archaeology, we're going to stop at the bottom of the tell at Elisha's spring. In the ancient days, the, the, the setting for an ancient city usually included two things. A hill to put your city on and a nearby spring to get your water from. 
you kind of have to have a defensible position and water. You can bring the food in from the fields and all the rest of that, but you kind of got to have a defensible position with water. And Elisha's spring was a, a big, freely flowing spring. But when they rebuilt the city hundreds of years later, in Elisha's day, they came to him and they said, you, you can see this is a really nice place, and it is. It's down in the Jordan Valley where it doesn't get cold in the winter. This is kind of tropical. You've got palm trees down there, folks. This is nice stuff down there. It's a nice place, and it's well watered, but the water's bad. It's toxic. It was probably hard on plants and harder on people. And, and they say, can you do anything for us? And Elisha said, yeah, get me a new container. Put some salt in it. He went out to the spring, sprinkled the salt in, and said, no more death from you. And that spring is good to this day. This are, these are the pipes drawing water from that spring. Now, those aren't one-inch pipes. There's some threes and some fours in there, and I think there's some fives and even some sixes, all sucking water out of this one spring. The whole city draws their water. That water is still good to this day. Uh, generous, plentiful supply. I think that's cool. I think that's cool. When I see all those pipes sucking all that water about out, I think Elisha and the bowl of salt <laughs> that healed the water back hundreds of years ago. But now, back to the archaeology on the tell right next to it. So here is a diagram of the city. On the right side, about halfway up, you see a blue there. That's the reservoir connected to the spring. And along the right side, you don't see a pink area because there's a road that's gone through there and taken out the edge of the tell. But the rest of it, you see uh, inside a, a kind of a purple circle. That's the, uh, the place where the inner upper wall would have been. And then the blue circle outside that is the outer city wall. Um, there have been several excavations over the years conducted there. Back in the, around 1910, some Germans uh, did an excavation. John Garstang did an excavation in the 1930s. And then a couple of decades later, Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s did an excavation there. The section A with a little da dashed line around it, that's where John Garstang uh, did his excavation. The two little boxes B, that's Kathleen Kenyon's excavations. And up at the north end, the upper end, uh, that's where the uh, Germans did their excavations. Garstang in the 30s, dated the destruction to 1400 BC, and that's very close to the biblical record uh, as to when that would have been. Uh, and, and you can uh, chase it down in the Bible uh, from a statement in 1 Kings 6 1. There was the fourth year of Solomon uh, when the uh, temple was, was begun, beginning to build, or dedicated, I guess it was. Yes, that was dedication. Uh, and that was 480 years after the Exodus. If you take off the uh, 40 years wandering in the wilderness before they came to Jericho, it's about 440 years since Jericho was conquered. Uh, and then you look up Solomon's fourth year, uh, and you discover that was probably 967 BC, which puts the fall of Jericho, biblically, right around 1407, something like that, maybe 1410, very close to that uh, in BC. Now, Kathleen Kenyon had said it was destroyed in 1550 B.C., which is about 150 years earlier. Uh, and we'll get to why she thought that a little bit later on. Kenyon and most archaeologists, for one thing, just don't pay attention to the biblical chronology. They, they are not interested in what the Bible says. They don't think it's authoritative. They think it's all fable and myth, and they pay no attention to it. Uh, they put the Exodus about 1250. B.C., generally. Uh, so she said there hasn't been a city there for 300 years when Joshua arrives, from 1550 when she said it was destroyed to 1250 when she says the Exodus is. So it's been 300 years since they had a walled city there. Well, if she was right about either of those times, uh, then her uh, proposition that there wasn't a walled city might hold something. But uh, we're going to show that she's wrong actually on both ends of that. This is a cross-section of the fortification walls of Jericho. See the little guy standing down at the lower left? That's kind of her scale. 
And right in front of him, the black is the stacked stones of the retaining wall that hold the side of the hill up. On top of that is the lower wall. Uh, and uh, in the diagram, I don't know if you can see it, it says the lower city wall, sometimes called a parapet. Uh, then there is a long slope, the blue there, and that was uh, plastered to prevent erosion, uh, stabilize the, the area. And then up at the top was the upper city wall. Uh, inside the upper wall is where government, king, high people live. A lot of the other people lived out between the two walls. Uh, and, and if you're the lowest of society, you live right down by the lower wall where you get run over first when there's an invasion. <laughs> so you kind of get your social pecking order clarified by where your house is on the tell. The higher you are, the, you know, that's your social status right there. Uh, who's going to get get conquered first when an enemy invades us? Where was Rahab's house? On the wall, so she could let the guys right out over the wall. She's right there on the wall. She's down at the bottom of society in, in Jericho. Uh, this is the retaining wall with one of the uh, workers there uh, during Kathleen Kenyon's excavations. You can see that it's a fairly tall uh, wall. There's a, a meter stick down at the bottom. I'm not sure. I think that's probably a two-meter stick. Uh, I, I was curious what those walls would look like with something I could compare it to. Uh, what would it have looked to the Israelites? So at the time, I was living in Janesville, Wisconsin. This is the city hall in Janesville, Wisconsin. Turns out that the face of the building is about the height of the retaining wall plus the, the brick wall on top. So if we put brick wall and retaining wall on top of it, now I left the door there and the guy on the sidewalk out front just for scale. Uh, about fi uh, uh, 15 feet of stone retaining wall plus another 25 feet of red muck, mud brick wall on top, which was 12 feet thick. So, so that's not an easy pushover mud brick wall. Uh, it's pretty substantial. So they had 40 feet of wall, and then there was the slope up behind and the upper wall, so the machinery on top of the roof can suggest to you that there's more higher up. This was the trench that Kathleen Kenyon dug through the side of the, the tell, and when archaeologists do that, they make a diagram of everything they find on that face of the side of the trench when they dig through, and this is her diagram of it. Uh, notice the yellow part with the black to the left of it there. The black is the retaining wall. The yellow part is the ramp going up the hillside to the upper. The red, uh, you might not see that, but on my diagram, her original notation says, fallen red bricks. It says what? Fallen red bricks. She found fallen red bricks. And she acknowledges, this is the wall that fell down. Probably an earthquake, she says. I don't know if God had an earthquake or just knocked the wall down. He could use an earthquake to knock the wall down. Whatever he did, it knocked the wall down right when he said. The wall came down. And notice how the fallen red bricks provide a really nice slope for the Israelites to go right up in, over the top of the retaining wall, into the city. Uh, these are cross sections of the retaining wall and base of the lower wall from two different excavations. On the left is the Germans, on the right is John Garstang, and you see the retaining wall, and then on top of the retaining wall, the, the lower city wall, uh, at least where there were remains of it. Now this is Jericho today. Sorry about the poor slide. Uh, I wish I had a better one. I think it's one I took, <laughs> and, and, uh, or I might have gotten it from a magazine. I don't remember for sure. The top part, uh, there is a vertical wall face, and at the right end, you can kind of see the stair steps down for the width of the wall. That's the upper wall. And then in front of it is the, the light-colored areas are still the plastering on the hillside going down to the lower wall. So there's remnants of that plastered hillside as well as remnants of the upper wall in, in a few places there in Jericho. Again, this is the artist's rendering of the walls falling out and down over the face of the retaining wall. Uh, this is Dr. Bryant G. Wood. 
And we'll talk a little more about him in just a moment. Uh, he's in the uh, area excavated in front of the retaining wall, and he's pointing to the area where the fallen red bricks are. Um, now, if you look really closely there, behind him and his hand, it looks a little bit redder than it does up to the left from there. That looks a little grayer. Let me throw a line in there for you. There's the dividing line between the, the red to the lower right and the gray to the upper left. That's the fallen red bricks from the wall. Kathleen Dis Kenyon discussed these fallen red bricks and said she thought they were from an earthquake. This is the excavation by John Garstang, and he concluded that the city was destroyed about 1400 BC. Kenyon writes about the destruction of Jer Jericho, and she says, the destruction was complete. Walls and floors were blackened or reddened by fire. Uh, the black would be from the soot from the fire, but if the fire gets hot enough, a lot of things turn redder, especially clay-based materials turn redder when they get cooked. They really got cooked. Uh, every room was filled with fallen bricks, timbers, and household utensils. And what? Household utensils. Not common in an ancient destruction of a city to find all the stuff still there. Why was the stuff still there? Because God told them, don't take anything. So the stuff is still there. In most rooms, the fallen debris was heavily burnt, but the collapse of the walls of the eastern rooms seems to have taken place before they were affected by the fire. Ooh, she must have been reading her Bible. Nope, nope, she wasn't reading her Bible. She's not paying attention to the Bible. What came first, the fire or the earthquake? The walls fell down first, and after that came the fire. No, walls fell down, they conquered the city, uh, they took only the metals and, and Rahab's family. Uh, everyone else was killed, and the city was burned after the walls fell. Uh, so she's got the chronology right on, on that. She discovered a debris layer a yard or more thick across her entire excavation area. This debris is visible in the, uh, the bank, uh, kind of at the, the top of the picture, uh, and uh, you see a meter stick leaning up against a bank there. So that's the excavated face uh, of, of the excavation, bulk, they call it. Uh, and right below the darker red section of that stick, from about the top of that down, do you see a darker layer there? That's the burned material. So it's, it's three feet thick-ish over her whole excavation. Now at Bethshan, for comparison, when we were there, uh, I had my son Jonathan put his finger on a burn layer when the city was destroyed and burned. How thick do you think the burn layer was at Bethshan? One or two inches. Everything else is scavenged. You take the goodies when you conquer the city. Nobody left the stuff to just burn three feet thick, except Jericho, where God told them to do that. Uh, also, across the lower left corner of the picture, you, you see a line of stones there, actually three lines of stones, and a little bit up from the middle of it, you see that it's actually two lines of stone separated a little. This is a stone-lined drainage ditch with a stone cover on top of it to take the wastewater from the city down and out the, the side of the tell. This is a cobblestone street that went down to the spring. And then a diagram uh, of the excavation area. And the red there is the burn layer that Kathleen Kenyon discovered. Uh, very thick and, and, and quite unusual. The most common thing found is what we usually find as the most common thing in an excavation in, in ancient Near East. Pottery and pot sherds. Uh, some complete, lots of pieces. 
Uh, and here, in this particular pot, uh, you can't quite tell what it is from the picture, but I'll tell you what's in that jar. That's burned grain, charred grain. That is rare. Like, really, really rare. The conqueror takes the grain. The conqueror always takes the grain. Besides which, there's other reasons why that wouldn't happen. Uh, these are more filled grain jars. The second most common thing found at Jericho after pottery and pot sherds was grain. It's extremely scarce. In any excavation in the Middle East, somebody was going to take the grain. If the invaders didn't, the locals would come back and find it. Nobody's going to just leave it there. Except if God tells you to do that, then you'll find the charred grain. It just dawned on me, God might have said burn the city so it would char the grain so it wouldn't rot so you'd know it was there. I never thought about that before. <laughs> grain that's not charred is going to rot. Your grain that's been charred is going to stay there for the archaeologists to find. Here are artists documenting the grain jars. And as I said, it is unique to the archaeology in Palestine to find large quantities of grain in place in an excavation. It just always got plundered. Now, what did the Bible say about the time they crossed the Jordan River and right after that they conquered Jericho? When did they cross the river? When, this, when it was flooding, and what season of the year did it flood? Harvest. harvest time. So their grain jars are full because they just harvested the grain. Just had the harvest. That didn't happen very often. <laughs> it didn't happen very often. Uh, Kathleen Kenyon attributed the destruction to the Hyksos. Now, you might not have heard of the Hyksos, but they invaded Egypt, took over Egypt, acted as if they were Egyptian pharaohs, took the, the dress of Egyptians, uh, took Egyptian kinds of names, but they were foreigners from up north. They were, they were related to the Hebrews and Canaanites and all. And they conquered Egypt. And the Egyptians hated them with a deep passion. And when Joseph comes to Egypt and he is bought by Potiphar, the Bible says that Potiphar was the captain of the king's guard and he was an Egyptian. What did you think you were going to find in Egypt? Oh, no, not too quick, not too quick. Because at that time, the Hyksos were ruling. And to have an Egyptian as the captain of the king's guard who has the king's life in his hands all the time is rare to think that, an, that a Hyksos king would trust an Egyptian to be his chief guard. And so it merits mention in the Bible record. He's an Egyptian, and that tells us this is the time of the Hyksos. And when another king arises who knew not Joseph and commands the destruction of the babies of all the Hebrews, the king who knew not Joseph is an Egyptian king whose father started the rebellion to get rid of the Hyksos and died in the battle. We've got his head with all the battle wounds. He, he, he would have died from any one of five wounds in his head. Uh, he died in battle. But his sons managed to throw the Hyksos out. Kathleen Kenyon said, oh, maybe it was the Hyksos fleeing from Egypt. But the archaeologists have a hard time believing that. Why would the Hyksos fleeing Egypt destroy the city they're fleeing to? Eh, no, you might take over. I mean, you might even chase the locals out. You might even take over their houses, but you're not destroy this is your retreat zone. Why would you destroy that? It doesn't make any real sense. And the Egyptians, when they started a siege, they often lasted two or three years. And on a lot of the time in the siege, the two sides are just sitting there staring at each other over the top of the wall. And what are they waiting for? They're waiting for the food to run out inside so that the people inside have to give up. They have to give up at some time when the food runs out. So you make that quicker by doing what? By staging your siege to start just before harvest. The Egyptians were very careful to do that. They always started their siege just before harvest. 
The inside guys have almost no grain, and we have fields full of grain. Ha! A double blessing, right? From, an, from the attacker's perspective, you want to start your siege just before harvest. And so for God to say, eh, wait, wait till they're done harvesting. <laughs> Not the way any other attacker would do it, but God has his purposes for what he's doing. He wants grain jars full of charred grain to prove that it was conquered the way he said it was. That's what he wants. He wants evidence that you can't deny if you're thinking with a clear mind that it happened exactly like it says in scripture. Another reason why it was no way the Egyptians is they ignored everything in the Jordan Valley and Jericho's in the Jordan Valley. They went up the coastal route all the time. They're going north and south through there frequently, but the Jordan River had no importance to them. They didn't care about Jericho. Jericho was unimportant. Not, not an issue at all to the Egyptians. These are lines with diagrams all the way around the, the perimeter of the wall of Jericho, and each of the diagrams shows what they found when they excavated. There's 13 spots there. Uh, and some of them show the fallen red bricks. Uh, kind of the middle of the left side, you see a nice example of that. Up at the top, number one, which is the top left, two and three and four, which is kind of on the right side again, those four all show some wall still standing on top of the retaining wall. Uh, all the other points, the wall itself is down. Excavations by the Germans at the north end of the tell uh, discovered that the walls of the houses are still standing, part of the city wall is still standing. The north end of the tell was not seriously affected by the walls falling. Um, so when Rahab let the spies out and they made a deal, she said, okay, I saved your lives, you saved mine. Okay, they said, any of your family who's in your house, when we come back, we'll be safe, but make sure you put the red cord you let us down with in your window so we find your spot again. So, and, and then Joshua said to those two spies, you guys' job today is to get to, Rachel's, uh, to Rahab's house and get her and her family out safe to our camp uh, through the middle of the melee. Uh, your job is to rescue them. Uh, so they went in. Uh, apparently her house was not destroyed. So here we have a picture of the area. On the far right, down below the retaining wall, you see a guy standing there? He's there for scale. Uh, and, and you can see, yeah, it's about a 15-foot wall there. And you can see some of the wall on top of the retaining wall. And then the walls of the, of the houses of the, of the city are, are still pretty much standing in this area. Now, I can't tell you which one of these walls is Rahab's house, but I'm pretty sure one of them is. One of these standing walls along the north edge of Jericho is Rahab's house. When we get to heaven and we meet Rahab, get a smirk on your face and go up to her and say, you lived on the north side of town, didn't you? <laughs> and she'll say, how did you know that? Well, because when they dug it up, that was the only side that had the houses still intact. That's how we knew that. You, you had to live on the north side of Jericho. Uh, and again, her house was built up against the wall uh, because she was in the cheap rent district. So at Jericho, the archaeologists have found it was a short siege. How do we know that? Well, because the grain jars are still full. If it was a long siege, they would be diminished. We'd find some empty jars, some half-empty jars. The grain would be going down, but we find full jars. So the siege was short. The walls fell out, except on the north side. The city was not plundered rare. It was burned after the walls fell. It was unoccupied for several, several hundred years, and that's all correct uh, according to the Bible, and that's what the archaeologists find. Now, it reminds me of what another archaeologist said. This was Nelson Gluick. He was a famous archaeologist uh, quite some time back, and he said it may be ca stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. I'm going to translate that to a little simpler English. 
We have never found anything that contradicts the Bible in our archaeology. That's what he said. We have never found anything that contradicts the Bible. They have things they haven't found that they think contradict the Bible. They will misunderstand what they've found sometimes, but they have never actually found anything that contradicts the Bible. Uh, it's exactly as the Bible describes. So why did Kathleen Kenyon say it was destroyed 150 years earlier? Well, she said that because she did not find any of a particular kind of pottery imported from Cyprus. Cypriot bichrome pottery, they call it. Bichrome because it's two colors, kind of black and red for the decorations. Uh, and there wasn't any in her excavation. And it's true, there wasn't any in her excavation. And that pottery was only in active use from about 1450 to 1400 BC, from about the time of the Exodus till just after Jericho was destroyed. That's the time period when those pots were used. And if you don't find any of those, it suggests, and she believes strongly, it meant there wasn't anybody here. There was nobody home here because there's none of those pottery here, none of that pottery. Let's take a look at it. This is Dr. Wood again. Uh, Dr. Wood happens to have his PhD on Canaanite pottery. Hmm. Uh, and he published in 1990 a re-examination of Jericho and its dating, and he said it's 1400 BC, like John Garstang said. Uh, these are some seals and scarabs that were found in tombs near Jericho. Uh, and to make it simple and sweet, uh, the top left, Tutmosis III, Amenhotep III on the right, Hatshepsut the lower left, and uh, again, Tutmosis Moses III, lower right. These are all kings involved with the biblical story or, or things nearby uh, from Egypt. And people were buried with these as good luck tokens. But they have a, a datedness to them according to who's the ruling king during your lifetime, the ruling pharaoh of Egypt. And so they, these are all from the 1450, 1500 BC, one of them is, is down into the 1386s. But a number of them suggest that Jericho was burying people between 1450 and 1400 BC, or these wouldn't be in their tomb. Something else would have been in their tomb. So there are people there burying their dead. Especially the Tutmosis III and the Hatshepsut scarabs have a very narrow range when they circulate. And, and it's, be, it's in the uh, uh, 1400s BC. This is Canaanite pottery, not the Cypriot bichrome that Kathleen Kenyon was looking for, which was the easy test. But this is the local stuff about which Dr. Wood happens to be an expert. His PhD is this stuff. And this stuff here is all stuff found uh, by Kenyon at Jericho, uh, which all dates in the 1400s BC, when you look at it carefully. So the first one at the top, the left side of the diagram is the inside of the pot and the right side is the outside of the pot. And on that one, it's the, the edge that slopes down and then there's a little bump there at the corner. That corner turn is called a carination. And how they do the corner turn changes with time. It's the style. You don't want the old style, you want the new style. These styles change. And, and you can date things quite closely by some of those styles. That's 1400s BC, the bowl below it. It's the uh, way the rings are painted on the inside. The third one down, it's the way the rim folds back on itself. The fourth one down, it's just the general shape of the cooking pot. They made them a, a different, slightly shape in other times. On the right hand side, it's an oil jug for reserve oil for your lamp. You remember the story of the wise and foolish virgins. This is the little flask that the oil would be in for the backup just like when the batteries run out on your flashlight years and years ago, you had spare batteries. Now, I don't know what we do now to plug it in again, I guess. <laughs> so that the, the height-width ratio on the little juglet for oil changes over time. Is it short and fat? Is it tall and skinny? It tells you it's the 1400s BC. This is Cypriot bichrome ware. It was found at Jericho. Wait, didn't I just tell you Kathleen Kenya didn't find any? John Garstang did. Kathleen Kenyon excavated right beside John Garstang's excavation. His was just a little further south than hers was. And his happened to catch 
a, a runoff channel from the top of the hill where, who lived up there? The rich people. And because the Cypriot bichrome ware is expensive imported stuff, only the rich people could afford it. Rahab and the people living down between the walls don't have it. That's where Kenyon excavated. Those people don't have it. But some of the washout from up where the rich people lived went down through John Garstang's territory, and he found some of it washed in from up, up the top of the hill. If she had gotten into the washover over zone, she'd have found some. Or if she'd have paid attention to what he found. What is really crazy is why she didn't pay attention to what he found, because he was her teacher. She was his student. And he told her, I think you should go back to Jericho and dig and, and kind of double check on what I did there. So she did. Whew. But she didn't pay attention to what he found. It, 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 it kind of blows the mind, actually, uh, how, how she would not pay attention to what he found. Um, so uh, Dr. Wood has taken a look at it, and he said, uh, yeah, th this is Cypriot bichrome ware, uh, and even some of the, the patterns used to decorate are classic Cypriot bichrome patterns. So, so just the things they paint on it tells you, oh, yeah, that's, that's them that did this. Uh, so after he published his re-dating to 1400 BC in, in Biblical Archaeology Review magazine, Somebody else wrote back in, and, and this is, I, I don't know the guy particularly, but his name is Pyotr Biankowski. And he said, no, 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 no. That's not Cypriot bichrome ware. That's just standard Canaanite pottery with black and red paint on it. Well, they know how to put black and red paint on Canaanite pottery. But uh, Dr. Wood says, no, no, it's not the same thing. And here's why. Wood says, the fabric. Now, the fabric of pottery is not something I was familiar with. I had to go look that up. It, it's the, the nature of the material used to make the pot. Right? This is a cross section of a broken shard. The, the, the sample here is actually from England. But having seen the pottery in, in uh, Israel, both the coarse uh, local Canaanite stuff and then the fine grain kind of stuff, which you also found, find down at, at uh, Petra, uh, Nabataean pottery, uh, the, the, the coarse stuff and the fine stuff is easy to tell apart. This is the coarse stuff. This is the fine stuff. Can you see the difference by looking at those? I mean, it's night and day. Night and day. This is gray in the middle, which means it was not thoroughly fired all the way through. And it has coarse grains in it. Uh, and... Um, the, the grits in there are quite coarse. Uh, pottery has what's called temper in it. I didn't know what temper is. But if you just make it straight clay, it's going to crack on you. Now that I didn't know. Potters would know this, but I'm not a potter. So you have to put other stuff in there to hold the structure somewhat, and they use sand and that kind of stuff ground up. Uh, and, and on the Canaanite stuff, you can see sand particles in there, right? On the other one, you don't see it, but it's in there. It's ground so fine you can't see it. That's classic Cypriot bichrome wear. Uh, and so uh, just to the naked eye, you can tell the difference between Canaanite and uh, Cypriot bichrome wear. And uh, Dr. Wood says, no, it, it's the Cypriot bichrome wear. Uh, he's a pottery expert. He looks at it and he says, I, 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 I can tell. And, and you can tell the difference. I can tell the difference. Uh, any of us could. John Garstang published a considerable amount of that pottery, which he called redware. Uh, and uh, Woods says, the local pottery? 1400 BC. The Cypriot bichrome ware? It's actually there. And it says 1400 BC. So there's no reason to say it isn't inhabited in 1400 BC. It was inhabited in 1400 BC. So again, the Bible record, harvest time, Seven day siege, the walls fell beneath themselves. It was not plundered, it was burned. About 40 years after the Exodus, biblically that would be about 410 BC, uh, and then uninhabited for 500 years. So the uninhabited part Kathleen's got is just the dating, which she said had to be earlier because there's no Cypriot bichrome ware here. But there was Cypriot bichrome ware there, and other things that say it was indeed an inhabited city at the time. So her assertion, there were no walls around Jericho when 
Joshua got there? Oh, when you look at it again, no, there were, there were. Uh, and God was careful to have the Israelites do things to show that it happened exactly as he said. Uh, it was a short siege. It was in harvest time. It wasn't destroyed by the Egyptians. It wasn't plundered. The walls fell out. There was a burn lair, uh, uninhabited for several years. Uh, every detail of the biblical account, and some quite unique in, in the whole of archaeology in the Middle East, uh, is exactly as God set it up to be. God's putting his fingerprint on this thing when he says, I want you to wait and cross in the middle of the flood. It's like, doesn't make sense. But God knows what he's doing. He's not just intimidating the local kings. He's leaving an, an irrefutable record in the archaeology that it happened just exactly like he said. I, I think that's so cool. Uh, and and the, the charred grain, uh, the whole thing is, is just so cool. Uh, and, and so it, it becomes clear that the Bible record is true uh, and uh, that we can trust the Bible record and its accuracy and trustworthiness. Uh, and and uh, I was pleased that somebody put me onto this. And at first I kind of, mm, whatever. Until I started digging. It's like, whoa, some cool stuff in there that God was doing. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. He, he knows how to put his fingerprint on stuff. So when we go back and look at it hundreds of years later, we get to say, ooh, that's exactly like he said, isn't it? Amen. And he leaves that record for us. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just so pleased that, that he did that at Jericho. Um, let's stand for a benediction. Lord, thank you so much that you were thinking about the future when you told the Israelites what to do at Jericho so that you would be preserving a record that would show beyond the shadow of a doubt it did happen. It happened exactly like you said. I thank you for that. Appreciate that. We know that, you're, um, that your word is correct, but it's kind of fun to see the, the proof in front of our eyes. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.